Hello, and welcome to the Occupied Thoughts podcast, a project brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Sarah Ann Minkin, the Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Foundation. Today is December 15th, 2022. My guest today is Rebecca Vilcomerson. Rebecca is the author of the recent report, Funding Freedom, Philanthropy and the Palestinian Freedom Movement, which we'll talk about today. She's a longtime activist who was the executive director of Jewish Voice for Peace from 2009 to 2019. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to talk about philanthropy and specifically about the funding of the movement for Palestinian freedom. In many ways, tis the season. Tis the season to talk about philanthropy. It's December, a time when nonprofit organizations across the U.S. are extra focused on fundraising. And I just want to say that fundraising like that is not something that the Foundation for Middle East Peace does. And in this conversation that Rebecca and I are about to have, we're not fundraising for specific organizations. But since we're on this topic, I strongly recommend and encourage listeners to go to the FMEP website, www.fmep.org, and look at our list of grantees and please consider supporting them. And for the grantees that are based in the Palestinian territories, which makes it more complicated to offer funding from the US, please feel free to reach out to me, Sarah Ann Minkin, directly. You can contact me via our website and we can talk about how you can help support those organizations. Thank you. And also, tis the season to talk about funding for Palestine because it's always the season to talk about funding for this movement and to talk about the dynamics of philanthropy. And I am so happy to have this conversation with Rebecca. And before we get started, I just I want to encourage everyone to listen to a webinar that Rebecca participated in a few weeks ago that marked the launch of this report. I'm putting a link to both the report and to the webinar that Rebecca was in uh, on our in the show notes and on our webpage. That conversation featured Palestinian movement leaders and philanthropic leaders alongside Rebecca, and it's a really important companion to the conversation that we are about to have. So now let's dive in. Rebecca, let, let's start with who you are and why we're talking about this topic today. Will you tell our audience about your background in your work and how, how they led you to focus on this topic at this time? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, there's a couple of, of threads I wanna pull out here. Um, the first is my experience, as you mentioned, as the executive director of Jewish Voice for Peace for 10 years, um, ending in 2019. So I came to this topic with long experience of seeking funding um, in order to do our work at, at Jewish Voice for Peace at JVP. And JVP, partially because in its early years was absolutely anathema to institutional funders due to our political positioning, um, which is sort of funny because those positions would now be considered quite tame. The things have moved so much that they're they're actually now quite, quite standard, but at the time they were absolutely impossible to get funded through institutions. So we really developed in those early years an ethos of fundraising as integrated with our political work. It wasn't siloed, it was, and it still is, JP still does it work this way, like the, like the crucial tool because we raise money from individuals rather than from institutions. So it enabled our political independence. It enabled us to be bold. It enabled us to allow our politics to evolve um, as long as we sort of, and it didn't depend on any specific donor. It depended on the collective of donors that we developed um, relationships with in order to keep doing our work. Just for, for our listeners who are, are new to the topic of philanthropy, you're talking about individual donors versus institutional donors. What's an institutional donor? Um, yeah, I think we're going to talk about that a lot more, but I think, you know, there's a lots of different kinds of institutional donors. There's sort of small family foundations, there's large foundations, you know, the most famous are like Ford Foundation, um, foundations like that, Rockefeller Foundation. Um, there are also other kinds of institutions like donor networks that bring donors together to act collectively. Um, there's funders networks that bring different funders together also to act collectively or think about practices within their field. Um, so there's intermediary organizations, which I think I'd put FMEP in that category. So there's all all different kinds of institutions that make up, like you're saying, the philanthropic field, including individual donors. And individual donors, of course, can range from giving, you know, five dollars once to giving, in some cases, not in, not not very much in our field, but can sometimes it's millions of dollars. Right. Um, so yeah, you know, that can range in, in, enormously. Thank you. Okay, I didn't mean to take you off track. Back no, to yeah, yeah. I appreciate the clarification. Um, 
But I think to go back to your original question, you know, when you're the executive director of an organization, your primary focus is by necessity your own work. And I hope that, you know, I brought an ecosystem approach to my work at JVP. Uh, but having left, I really do have the space now, I think, to think more broadly about what's needed for the Palestinian freedom movement to thrive and succeed, um, not just an organizational point of view, but a sort of ecosystem view. And I don't think anyone would argue that we, and when I say we, I mean the big collective we, all the, all the organizations and movements that are working towards um, Palestinian freedom. I don't think anyone would argue that we are you know, not the, the David's up against Goliath in terms of the sheer amount of money that goes to protect and defend and advocate for Israel. And that includes specifically attacking and defaming and delegitimizing Palestinians and organizations that support them. So that inequity in funding, of course, also didn't just happen. It's not just like a natural state of the world. It's due to a series of decisions and priorities and historical factors that are also political in nature. So, so that's one thread, that sort of personal experience. The right. other is um, having had the opportunity in the spring of 2021 to do some political education with members of Solidaire. Solidaire is a donor network, as I just mentioned. So it's a collective of donors um, that pool their funding and do education, peer education with each other um, in support of um, mostly racial, gender, and climate justice in the case of Solidaire. So I was invited by one of their members, um, Deborah Sagner, to do a series of, about political education, about Palestine, like the fight for Palestinian freedom in the context of progressive movements. Um, so they're doing really exciting work. And in the wake of that political education series, and then also in continuing conversation with folks at Grassroots International and the Sagner Family Foundation, um, all of which in various ways have supported organizing for Palestinian freedom, the idea came up that we kind of really need to start to look at the gaps and challenges and opportunities of this moment, that there's very specific conditions um, that are happening right now. Um, and one of the crucial gaps is, of course, what I just mentioned, that vast inequity of funding and how that impacts what is possible to achieve. So that was sort of the genesis of the report that you referenced in your intro. Um, and then for the report itself, I interviewed almost 30 people, um, again, from all those different types of institutions that I mentioned earlier, family foundations, large foundations, donor networks, intermediaries, um, also individual donors, Palestinian and Arab American donors, Christian donors, Jewish donors, folks who didn't identify by any of those labels. Um, and there's a lot about what I found that I hope we're going to get into, but part of the reason to me this moment is, is really exciting and crucial is, again, that there are opportunities and the beginning of a funding structure that wasn't there before. So there are, you know, there are individuals and organizations, including FMEP, um, that have now put in years of work, really, of investing in and thinking about how to support Palestinian liberation. So that that thinking also went into the report, which was published by Solidaire. And like you mentioned, we had this really wonderful launch webinar with a lot of people on it. And my hope is that with the report, we can sort of look at the systematic barriers that exist across the sector and also look at how they can be addressed systematically and strategically. And so thinking about not only how to enlarge the overall amount of money that's going to support organizations doing this work, but how it is given. So I don't, you know, I, I would imagine that listeners of this podcast don't need to be convinced, you know, that doing so is urgent, but, you know, delving into um, how to do it and, and, and what's needed in order to be successful at it. Great. Thank you. That's a great, that's a great start for us. And we're going to, um, we're going to delve in deeper. I want to, I want, I want to, I feel like I, I want to respond to, um, to, to two things. I want to build on that you just said. So one is, I, I just want to point out, and I think our, our listeners know, but um, if they're new to the organization, I, I want to say that the Foundation for Middle East Peace is not a Palestinian organization or an Israeli organization or a Jewish organization. Um, Foundation for Middle East Peace, FMEP, is an American organization. Our, our board of directors is made up of experts and diplomats who served in Israel-Palestine and, and in the broader Middle East. Um, but your background, Rebecca, I'm Jewish. And you're Jewish. Your background is from Jewish Voice for Peace, and it it might seem awkward uh, to some of our listeners that the two of us are having this conversation about Palestine and philanthropy. Um, and I so I I want to recognize that fact to state it, bring bring it into the room so clearly, uh, and also to make clear that we are talking about um, today major tools that are crucial to supporting the project of Palestinian freedom, and this is a project led by Palestinians, but that 
uh, deserves and demands uh, support from a much wider universe of allies. And so our, our discussion today and the, your report, the analysis that you, um, that you produced looking at the dynamics of, of philanthropy in the US are, um, I think, examples of what meaningful allyship and support look like. So I just wanna state that and have that be part of our conversation. I, I really appreciate you naming that. Thank you, um, and I hope that that is that that is true. That's that's the that's the goal. That's the goal. Thank you. Um, and then I I really want to follow up on one of the things that you started with when you started when you were talking about making decisions and funding at JVP. And then um, I think you'll un unpack this more. But funding is political. Funding is a is a is a political process. Um, will you unpack that? just that what that idea for us yeah yes i would love to because i think sometimes you know we live in we live under capitalism <laughs> so, so we sometimes we don't think about the ways that money is really is is political and it's political in all kinds of ways i want to name two two ways specifically um first of all it, sorry to sound obvious but it just needs to be said as we're unpacking is that we live in a world where we need money to get things done um, and organizations um, that are fighting for Palestinian liberation have far less money than organizations on the right um, that of course also you know you can all go all the way to the top where there's Israel's receiving 3.8 billion dollars a year in military aid from the U.S. Um, Palestinians receive at best a few hundred million dollars a year in essentially humanitarian aid. So that inequity goes all the way to the you know the macro level. Um, but we want to talk about organizational support, and, and in particular, you know, again, we're focusing not so much on we're focusing on on the political work that that we're trying to, that the, the broad movement is doing. Um, there aren't really comprehensive up-to-date numbers about money going to organizations, but there are some stats that I can share to give some sense of the scale. Um, so in 2014, the, the forward did an analysis and found that about four to $5 billion a year is raised by Jewish organizations in support of Israel. Um, they didn't break it out. So that could include you know, broad support like to hospitals and universities, also to political advocacy, but that's a very large number, obviously. Um, in 2015, as a companion to that, Haaretz found that between 2009 and 2013, 501c3 organizations, which is nonprofit organizations, those organizations alone gave $200 million in support to settlement projects. So that is, you know, very explicitly political giving. I think you can argue that any of this giving is political in, in certain senses, but this is a very specific, you know, very specific aim when you're giving to settlements. Um, and then Christian Zionist organizations as of 2016 were estimated to be giving about 175 to $200 million yearly to Israel. And that's often in support of settlements. So you can see that 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 amount of funding is really just enormous. Um, I will say one thing that's interesting, if anyone knows of any research that's been done, I'd love to hear about it, but I have not did not find any research that really had any reliable numbers about the amounts of money that are going to organizations that are supporting Palestinian rights. Um, that may be, you know, I think that's an interesting area to explore for someone who does that kind of research. So we don't really have a great comparison, but we know that it's much, 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 much less. And I will also say that that's echoed in the electoral realm, um, which we saw extremely intensely in this midterm cycle. So for example, APAC and its affiliate affiliates gave $4.5 million to defeat Summer Lee, who did end up winning her campaign. But in many other campaigns around the country, the influx of millions of dollars from these sources really made the difference. So another example, that would be Jessica Cisneros. She was a Democratic candidate in Texas who never actually even spoke a word about Israel-Palestine. Um, I think her profile was progressive enough. In some ways, it's a reflection of the success of the fight for Palestine liberation that because she was in favor of um, universal health care and education for all and all the sort of progressive um, immigrant rights, all the sort of progressive um, ideas and causes that you would, that, that, a, that a, a progressive candidate supports it was assumed that she would also be more supportive of palestinian rights and she was in a primary against a very right-wing democrat who was anti-abortion pro-gun um and he got a lot of support from again from apac and affiliates as well as um, the democratic leadership i'm sorry to say and she lost her primary but if by a few hundred votes so you can see just the impact that money has um you know in a in electoral um and especially in electoral cycles it's much easier to <laughs> it's much easier to measure um but you know we i 
it has an enormous, enormous impact. So we know that money makes a difference um, in what the movement for Palestinian liberation can accomplish and in what we're up against, um, you know, what can be accomplished against it. But I did also want to go into, oh, do you have a, yeah. Well, just, yeah, before, before you go into that, I just want to um, remind our listeners that we've actually, we did a several programs about the impact of um, right-wing funding on the election cycle. Um, this is our first, as far as I can recall, this is our first conversation about philanthropy overall in, Pal in the Palestinian rights movement. But in terms of the electoral cycle and the role of APAC and just the enormous investment, spe specifically in the Democratic primaries in this past year, I will put links to those um, programs in uh, on the webpage for this conversation also. But just if you're looking for um, if you're looking for numbers and and to dig deeper into what Rebecca's talking about, then we have those resources for you. Uh, and um, I'll also put links to the reports that Rebecca is talking about, the, the research on the um, four to five billion dollars in of uh, Jewish philanthropy that is going to Israel per year and the hundreds of millions of dollars of Christian Zionist philanthropy going to, to Israel and likely to settlements. And then the other, the, the piece from Haaretz in 2015, which was a big piece of research on how much money from 501c3, so U.S. Um, tax tax blessed money uh, going to settlements. So we'll have links to all of that on on the webpage for this uh, podcast so you can dig into it further and, and see as much as it's actually possible to see. And in another conversation, we'll talk about donor advised funds and why it's impossible to trace that money, which is a whole other oh, can of yeah. worms. And that's, a, 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 that's, a, that's another huge issue. I'm thrilled to hear you guys are covering that. And yeah, and I think again- I'm saying that aspirationally, whole... that we'll yeah. cover. <laughs> okay, <great. laughs> cover. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the, again, the, it is, there is a lot of conversation happening in the electoral realm. And I think what I would argue is that when we're the kind of philanthropy, philanthropy that we're talking about, which is about supporting, organizing, supporting power building, you know, it's a long continuum, which includes elections. Um, and of course you have, it get it's separated legally in its form, 501c3 or 501c4, but it's um, part of the same set of strategies and tactics that are you know, everyone has their lane, people are pursuing different things, different kinds of campaigns, different kinds of organizing, but they all are parts of the things that we need to do in the United States to um, work for Palestinian freedom. Great, thank you. So I did also wanna delve a little bit into the question of how money is given. Um, so the philanthropic sector is going through a bit of a transition, um, parts of it, and we're really, you know, this this report was geared to the more progressive or left wing of the philanthropic sector that already recognizes movement building as important and identifies um, with that kind of work. But parts of it, the specific part of it, are beginning to recognize the inherent power inequities in giving. This is well beyond in relation to just to Palestine. Um, so it's a it's it's across every movement. Um, so individuals and organizations with money can you know generally can dictate often in philanthropy what activities are undertaken. Um, they can ex exert a lot of onerous requirements on grantees. They can be fickle in who they give to. Their trends. They can you know give to give for a while and then change their mind. So there's a lot of interesting experimentation and in new forms of giving. Giving again more to organizing and power building rather than to um, addressing symptoms. Giving general grants instead of for specific grants, specific projects rather. Um, committing to long-term su to support of organizations, um, and then even democratizing decision-making of who gets grants. So it's not just the people who have money, but the people who have expertise, grassroots expertise on the ground. So the, all of that's sort of on the theme of, of, again, recognizing expertise, recognizing leadership of the grassroots, and that's where some of the most exciting shifts are happening more generally in philanthropy. And that is in part, I think, a response to a long-term left critique um, of the philanthropic sector and of the nonprofit sector more generally. And that was first articulated in a conference and book and anthology that's called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded Beyond the, uh, the Nonprofit Industrial Complex. That was published by Incite Women of Color Against Violence in around 2007. And actually it was originally inspired by the Ford Foundation reversing their decision to give money to Incite because of their support for Palestine. So you can see how far back this issue goes. It's a long-standing issue. And so that developed into a, a larger critique of the way that the impact and positions of social justice movements are often blunted purposefully um, and not purposefully at times um, by both the nonprofit form and by 
foundation giving. And, you know, I just want to acknowledge that there's a portion of the left that's just categorically against funding and professionalization for these reasons. And it's an active debate in the Palestinian movement and in many other movements about, you know, what it means to accept that kind of funding. And I think it's really worth thinking about these kinds of critiques and how to be responsive to the very real issues that they bring up, even for those of us who do think that under the conditions that we live in, we do need funding um, and we do need the capacity that funding brings in. I think it's pretty obvious that I fall into that camp, um, but it's also not all or nothing. You know, it's possible to be possible both as a funder and as a receiver of funds to have principles about how you give and how or what you receive. Um, and you could say that much of this report that I wrote that we're talking about is an attempt to pull out both the current both best and worst practices of how that's done and how the sector as a whole can do better. That's great. Thank you for all of that. And so let's let's dive in. I mean, and, and I and I just I want to say, um, I mean, I want to dive into the report into the sector overall that you're that you're talking about. So you're you were very clear that you were talking about um, funding of movement organizations, funding of movement dynamics, of power building and organizing. Um, and that that is, I think, a, a core part of what you're talking about when you're talking about the movement for Palestinian freedom. Um, you're focusing on these organized efforts that are geared towards shifting political dynamics and, and the status quo. And I just want to separate because you did in the in the report, you're separating that from what you're calling purely humanitarian efforts, um, which are not about that. Those are about what you're calling treating the symptoms and not about dealing with the status quo. So just just to sort of clarify what what we're talking about, um, and also that when you're talking about the dynamics of funding here, um, you're talking about organizations in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, and you're talking about Palestinian organizations throughout historic Palestine. You're also, I think, talking about um, organizations in the US that right. are working for the Pal right. for Palestinian freedom movement. So, um, okay, so all that said. Yeah, so, thank you for clarifying all that. That's that's helpful. Um, I was a, I'm a, a diligent reader of your work. <laughs> um, so, and I'm so excited that we're actually like able to dig in and, and, and to really talk about this stuff. So, um, tell what are the tell us about the funding dynamics and and what the what the big trends are, please. Sure. Well, I want to start with the positive because, I, like I said, I think there's like there's some really important opportunities happening in this this current moment, um, and some of them again may seem obvious, especially to your listeners who are generally very well informed. But I think it's important to sort of name them all together um, because they add up to something. So the first is of is that unconditional support for Israel and the United States, which used to be a matter of bipartisan consensus, really no longer holds. Um, and young people and people of color are much more likely to support Palestinian rights. And that's reflected consistently in polling. Um, I won't go into all the polling, but some of it's cited in the report. Um, there's also now basically in the last couple of years, a public consensus about among the most respected human rights institutions, you know, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, B'Tselem, um, in Israel, following Palestinian organizations who had been saying so for a very long time. But there is a consensus that Israel is an apartheid state, which is a powerful call with a really historic resonance um, for solidarity and accountability. And I think that shifts the landscape as well. And of the people that I interviewed and spoke to, um, many of them cited the principled solidarity of groups like the Movement for Black Lives and Indigenous Land Back movements and other movements that are re in relation with those movements as having had the most influence in opening up space to talk about Palestinian rights and freedom. So donors who have already aligned with those movements are more likely to understand the values that these movements and the Palestinian freedom movement share and are more oriented to a sort of anti-racist framework that's important in, I think, in understanding um, this struggle as well. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, the progressive philanthropic world is in a process of internal reflection and change that really came out of the murder of George Floyd in 2020 after you know, many years of the movement for black lives. But in, it includes a generational shift in staffing, in, again, including more people of color, um, internal political education about enacting anti-racist principles, um, and again, and a turn towards an ecosystem approach that 
understands the way that different movements relate to and reinforce one another and the importance of aligning values across their different programs. So that also makes them more open um, to the Palestinian movement. And then, you know, finally, as I mentioned earlier, but I want to say again, there is a core group of funders, individuals and institutions who have been working diligently for many years now to open up the sector and they're in conversation with each other and they're actively directing funding and other forms of support to groups in the US and on the ground creatively and strategically. And so they've really been working to get us to this moment. And I wanna, wanna really acknowledge that, but that's an important, one of the important shifts that we're talking about. Um, so having said all that, just as an example of what's at stake, I wanna briefly tell the story of one of the case studies in the report, which was when the Movement for Black Lives um, put out the Vision for Black Lives uh, back in 2016, um, which was um, a, you know, a very powerful moment. Again, it was after the Movement for Black Lives had, um, had, had just started to gain power in the United States. They put out this Vision for Black Lives, which is this pretty incredibly researched um, incredibly detailed, um, really exciting document that that was looking talking about a, a future for Black people in the United States at a time that it was incredibly important. It had a few paragraphs, two paragraphs, I think, um, that talked about in the context of also some other international movements that talked about solidarity with Palestinians. Um, it included the word genocide, which is a word that um, that in the black community is used um, in many different contexts um, as a serious critique. And when the platform first launched, it had a pretty significant impact publicly, but after just a few, few days really, um, member organizations of the Move for Black Lives started saying that they were getting calls, concerned calls from funders and individuals in positions of power um, in various different places. Um, and pressure started to really build um, with, especially with Jewish organizations ranging from, from liberal to right-wing Zionist organizations, putting out statements and articles condemning the platform and accusing the movement for black lives of anti-Semitism. People stopped wanting to host movement for black lives at events. Um, there were in-person protests, there were security concerns. And what it ultimately meant, what, what ultimately happened was that one of the biggest foundations that had made a very, very substantial in more than in over a hundred million dollar commitment to the to the movement for Black Lives, um, ended up withdrawing their gift, um, and that of course put an enormous amount of internal pressure on the coalition. Um, the gift had been public, but the retraction of it was not. Um, so there was an impression that movement for Black Lives had a level of funding. It did not. Um, and again, all of this, this these concerns were centered on the language around support for Palestinian rights. Um, and you know that was so this this sort of incredible potential of this moment was really um, undermined by this focus on these couple of paragraphs within the Vision for Black Lives platform. I think some of the some of the it's hard to call it exactly good news, but things to reflect upon in this story is that during this time, Movement for Black Lives did receive some crucial support. A number of Jewish organizations. Um, publicly defended the platform. And so that was able to sort of interrupt the, the idea that the Jewish community in quotes was uniformly against the platform. And maybe most- You're, saying in, you're saying in quotes as meaning as if the idea that-, that, that like, When you say, you know, the Jewish community, the word the Jewish community is thrown around a lot about what the Jewish community believes. And by having even a few Jewish organizations um, able to say like, we support this platform. We think it's a really important thing for the world. and. And, and for black people and for Jewish people and for black and Jewish people. Um, so th that that was to be able to interrupt the idea that there was a uni one position within the Jewish world about the platform. And I think that was very important. Thank you. But I think most importantly, again, this is based on the interviews that I did, um, staff and foundations, especially black staff, organized and stratified, strategized within philanthropy to muster support. Um, so this is a story that happened in 2016. Um, eventually, the movement, the movement for Black Lives was able to hang together, obviously. Um, they did start getting funding again, especially in, in 2020, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. Um, but the reverberations are still, and the, so the current situation is different, but the reverberations about it are still being felt. Um, and I think just the energy and attention and 
respect that had been the response to the launch of the platform were really deflected to a conversation exclusively focused on that section about um, Palestine and accusations of anti-Semitism, which did impede efforts to promote the platform as a whole. So it is a bit of a, a cautionary tale um, in terms of, you know, and again, I think maybe illustrates some of the things we were talking about, the ways that funding is, is intertwined with other strategies and tactics and impacts, um, and that we need to be able to think about them all together. Um, and I think it's also just really an example of the way philanthropy can be a real gatekeeper and really polices the boundary of, you know, what's called, again, in quotes, acceptable discourse. Um, and that impact that it has, you know, we're talking about Palestine right now, but that has an impact far beyond the Palestinian rights movement on, on the left as a whole. Will you say more about that piece? Yeah. Um, in terms of the policing of the boundaries, you mean, or about yeah. the... Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, first of all, historically, it's been very hard to even talk about Palestinian rights and freedom in the vast majority of philanthropic spaces, let alone coalesce around individual or, or collective support. And, you know, this is true also outside of the sector. It's in no way, <laughs> you know, the sector is not exceptional in this regard at all. It's a reflection of the rest of the world. But I think the fear of being called anti-Semitic or of offending powerful donors has, has largely silenced these conversations or had silenced these conversations. And even in self-identified progressive spaces and networks, there are red lines, specifically around talking about Zionism or anti-Zionism or beyond the occupation have made even these conversations um, that were those conversations that were happening limited in scope. Um, you know, and again, this goes back to what you were saying. It's a little awkward to talk about, but I do want to name it anyway. Jewish foundations that are progressive in their approach to domestic funding and also define themselves as Zionist have exerted pressure on their peer organizations and on their networks and on grantees to constrain the parameters of conversations, not to mention what, what and who are funded. Um, one of the organizations that I interviewed called the need to fit inside the parameters laid down by their liberal Zionist funders traumatic. Um, and I think that trauma is multifaceted. It disempowers Palestinians. It reinforces existing power structures. Um, it makes Palestinian grantees feel forced to make compromises in order to do their work. Um, and when funding is allocated to Palestinian organizations specifically, it can still be harmful when it lacks political framing because it can reinforce the fragmentation of Palestinian people and enforce the bar barriers between them. Um, so barriers, for example, between Palestinians in Israel, Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Um, so, you know, as this example that I just mentioned shows, organizations or movements who, who step outside these lines can be punished by withdrawn funding or being blacklisted from opportunities. Um, there's another case study in the report um, that talks about that in more detail about AROC, which is an anti-Zionist Arab direct service and organizing group in the Bay Area that has um, had went through that experience and is, you know, just it, it, it was able to be documented. They were able to retro, retroactively document that, but that, that sort of thing often happens in silence and you, it can't be, it's hard to prove it, <laughs> often can't be proven. So I think we, we need to, first of all, make these trends visible, name them, um, and then do the education and organizing work to dismantle them. And yes, and, and your report, I think, and I really recommend to the listeners that they, that they read it because um, I think it's a really, useful document with a number of case studies. You've, you've talked about one, you mentioned another, but case studies and also like you go really in depth into the, the trends and the, the, um, both the impediments and the strategies for what it can look like to, to, um, to support Palestinian rights for them to support the, to support the movement. But I, I just listening to you talk about the, this gatekeeping um, or this, this policing aspect of funding, the way that funding can reinforce really harmful dynamics, whether the, they are the dynamics of um, fragmenting Palestinians. So you you only support, you know, Palestinians uh, inside of Israel, Palestinian citizens, and only if they, they only, only if their identity work fits into a liberal Zionist identity frame. And right. that reinforces a fragmentation that um, cuts Palestinians off from their, from other Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank and the diaspora. So that's like one way that that policing and gatekeeping can work or or what else what you also talked about, which is um, how 
organizations talk about Zionism overall, for instance, or, or anti-Zionism, um, and that funders can police how their grantees talk and the positions that they take. And, and I, so I just, I, I, it feels important to me to point out that um, in so many cases, funders are trying to reshape the world according to their vision for the world. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is like a, I think an, an inbuilt part of the American ethos of enormous wealth, which is that um, that is what funders are supposed to do is to, they have ideas about the world and they are supposed to bring them into, into being. And one of the things that I think is so useful and helpful in your report is that you return again and again to the question of um, how do these priorities look when you listen to Palestinians mm -hmm. responding to them or Palestinians describing their experiences interacting with them? Your case studies, your case study about AROC, for instance, is about a Palestinian organization talking about interacting with funders and what that experience is like, or many of your interviews are about how does philanthropy look for Palestinian-led organizations? What What is the experience here? And so I think that it's true in, in any field that it's you have to listen to the grantees, you have to listen to the people who are actually carrying out the work. But especially in, in, in our field, where Palestinian voices for so long have been systematically sidelined or undermined um, or or suspected such that when Palestinians speak, you're already a, a, a non-Palestinian audience is already, um, I think, socialized to be suspicious of the Palestinian voice. I think that um, your report is doing a real service by 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 centering Palestinian voices in this conversation around funding and philanthropy. Um, so thank you for that and for that shift in the and the lesson on on philan on how to do philanthropy in a political way, which is um, I think what you're what you're doing really, really um, to me really persuasively. Um, so my question for you then is, um, okay, you've described all the impediments. You've described the movement, you've described the trends, you've described the impediments. Um, will you talk to us about strategies that funders can use to to actually move funding, move needed resources into the movement for for Palestinian freedom? Yes, I would love to do that. Before I do that, I do you know because I think we just had a really great conversation about philanthropy and the way it gatekeeps, and also I wanted to mention the way sometimes even just the silence, um, you know, is is part of that gatekeeping and you know not being just to exclude conversations about it entirely but I did want to mention briefly if it's okay with you a few of the other um, barriers to, to funding that um, are encountered you know that that make it harder to give absolutely um, please give. so so you know there just are numerous tactics out there and again this is something FMEP has covered extensively but just I think it's helpful to name them together to remind folks just how much is is out there um, in combination so there's just numerous tactics that purposefully sow fear and increase the cost of vocalizing of vocally supporting Palestinian rights um, one huge one is the weaponization of ac accusations of anti-Semitism, again, which FNEP has been a real leader in addressing, um, which includes attempts to pass into law the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which essentially makes Palestinians telling their own lived experience of occupation and expulsion anti-Semitic by definition. So exactly what you were just saying about making sure that Palestinians are centered in this conversation, that does the opposite of that. Um, and it also has an incredible chilling effect. And just wanted to note that there's a whole set of well-funded right-wing organizations whose literal entire purpose is to sow fear of supporting Palestinian rights. So there's tactics ranging from frivolous lawsuits to online smear campaigns to campaigns often successfully to get people fired who speak out in various fields, um, even spying and surveillance and threats of violence. Um, and then also even, you know, terrorism designations, both in the US and in Israel, which are political in nature and are defined politically, um, have made it even more dangerous or perceived to be dangerous to give freely. Um, and I just did want to also note that, you know, anti-Arab racism and Isl Islamophobia underlie a lot of those tactics. Um, and it's baked into US law. It makes political giving fraught and frightening. Um, particularly for Arab American and Muslim Americans who have had experiences um, with prosecution um, 
from the US by the US when they give um, to political, you know, about to do political advocacy. But it's also is present, you know, in just in collective giving patterns, like it's about who we who people know and trust like that's a lot of how philanthropy gets done is word of mouth willingness to put our faith and money into organizations led by Palestinians, Arabs and Muslims. So that is part of the systemic um, inequities that we're seeing in who does get funding. Um, so, so, so I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned those as well, because it is about the way philanthropy works, but it's also about those, those tactics, which we see across, you know, not just obviously the, the main recipients of those are organizations themselves, um, not people who give, but it is part of the conditions that are facing. I'm so glad that you insisted on on um, bringing those up that that is so important to include and to name and to have those those pieces of the greater dynamic be part of the conversation and and it's a reminder that philanthropy is happening inside the the um the environment and the, and the political dynamics that are shaping the rest of our That's of our right. of our world um yeah. and and for our listeners rebecca said that fmap has done a lot of work on on these topics and i really want to encourage you to explore we have a lot of resources on the weaponization of accusations of anti-semitism um and on the ihra uh definition and on its impact specifically on palestinians but but not only also in academia um in in many different settings um and i in this moment of rising anti-semitism across the U.S. and not only across the U.S., but rising actual anti-Semitism that seeks to to um, to harm Jews for being Jews. I think that it's especially important that we get very clear on the ways in which criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitic. Right. And um, and so the IHRA definition is that much more dangerous in a, in a time of rising anti-Semitism, which we are in. Right. Um, so that's one piece. And, and the other, which Rebecca just said also about the, the terrorism designations of civil society organizations um, is also something that FMEP has been fighting back on and something that needs and deserves a lot of publicity um, in, in Israel uh, declaring human rights organizations to be terrorist organizations. And we also have a lot of resources on our website um, specifically about that. So I uh, encourage our listeners to, I will put links on the homepage and explore our website. We've got, we've got a lot on all this stuff. Um, okay. So now Rebecca has really set us up for how, how hard things are in the philanthropic world and, um, what the we'll get hard, but with opportunity, you know, like I think hard, but with opportunity out there. And again, I want to just emphasize that, that this is not like a, this is not only a story of all, you know, and I don't want to, didn't want to name all these things just to say how terrible they are, but just, so we can understand the the interlocking impacts, but but want to remind the folks of the beginning of the conversation, which is about all the ways that um, conditions have changed and made it um, easier and more possible. Also, so it's both at the same time. So tell us, like, unpack those opportunities for us. Yeah. Well, first, I want to say that you know this this report was geared to the philanthropic sec sector, so these recommendations are for everyone involved in the giving side in any capacity. I do think it would be interesting to talk about what could be done, maybe even collectively, by organizations that seek funding. So that's, I think, you know, a separate conversation and interesting area to explore. But these these are recommendations for people who are giving. Um, there are some relatively small things that can be done, which is even just donors educating themselves about some of the barriers that, that I just named um, and advocating within your own networks, you know, for against things like that, like explaining, understanding the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and, um, and, and advocating against it, being aware of the additional barriers that Palestinian led organizations face and adjusting your support accordingly, um, offering support to organizations to make sure they have the resources they need to invest in their people's physical and online safety, because there's a real actual dollar cost to the security threats that organizations face. So there's things like that. And, you know, people, donors, especially donors who have, who have some more resources tend to be, you know, well networked into various kinds of, um, places where these are really important conversations to be to be had. So even even things like that, those kind of interventions are very important. In terms of broader strategies across the sector, and I do think it's important to say that, um, you know, 
because there's no one organization or person that could can address these things alone. Like I think that was part of the reason it felt important to write this report. These are sort of cross sector strategies that we need to think about how to implement widely. Um, so we I sort of divided them into four categories. Um, one is being prepared. Um, the next is donor organizing and political education and peer support. The third is countering philanthropic history, some of the stuff we talked about earlier. And the last one is concrete action. So I'm not going to go into them all in detail that are in the report, but I wanted to name a few of them that I think are really important. Um, the first one is being, again, being prepared for pushback and not all donors get pushback for their giving, um, but it happens enough that it's best to be prepared. Um, so that includes being able to show that your gift aligns with your general principles. If you have a board or staff, making sure that you know that you're prepared to defend the gift um, making sure that you've had the political education to speak with confidence not necessarily expertise but confidence about how the gift fits in with your work and having a communications plan to communicate internally and externally to your networks as needed again this sounds maybe a little basic but i'm thinking about a couple of the examples that i that i talked about in the ways that how damaging it is when um there's so much pressure that a gift gets reversed and so being prepared and knowing that you don't that you're don't do that um that being able to to hold the line and you can hold the line if you have that internal confidence and internal alignment right. um, part of one of the things you need to do in order to do that is making sure you've set principles that apply to all grant making i think that applies to individual donors it's worth thinking about like why who do you give to why do you give to them what are the values that that lead your giving um and that's also something especially if you're a larger institution that it's important to do because it creates a a baseline for being consistent it helps you expose potential inconsistency around the application of commitments to human rights or democracy or freedom and justice um it helps to build like a solidarity framework and also again a basis of defense for funding decisions if they're questioned um, in the case of, of Palestine, where you have, you know, great, again, greater fears and stereotypes and pressure. Um, so it's an essential tool to have. Um, so that's a, an important thing to do. Donors can also build their collective power. And this is something I'm really interested in. I think there's enormous untapped potential in funders uniting to advocate together for shifts in philanthropy and public and, and public policy. And again, in general, people who have more money tend to have more, you know, political and public cachet. And so there's a lot of um, places where I think um, where donors can come together. I think there's, you know, there's this one effort around called Funders for Palestine, where donors came together to think and talk about how to um, fight against the, the designation of Israeli human rights organizations as um, Palestinian human rights organizations in Israel as designated as terrorists. And that, that sort of gave a window into the potential collective power um, that funders can have if they work together to think through like what are the most important things to advocate for or against <laughs> together. Um, so that's really important. Yeah. Um, Wait, before you keep going, yeah. I just want to jump in. Um, since FMEP was really happy to, to be a part of that Funders for Palestine, um, that moment of pushing back against the designation of the six uh, and, to, and to do some convenings of, of funders around that time. Um, and I just wanted to add like for your first point around being prepared, that I think one of the things that is so um, helpful and necessary, and you you said this, so I'm just repeating what you've already said, but I'm gonna say it again, which is um, that funders talk to each other yeah. because you can, you can, we can, you, we can share resources and strategies and also be be supportive. Also, many of us like like FMEP, I mean, if you look at our list of grantees, we have done all of the homework on those grantees yes. and we are more than happy to connect any funders to any of the grantees and then also help funders to, to figure out what work they need to do uh, in order to be ready for any pushback for funding them. Um, and, I, and I know that we're not alone in being funders who, are, who want to be allies to other funders in that way. That's, that is a part of what it is to build this, this network of, yeah. of funders and support. That, 
that is such a perfect lead into what I was going to say next, which is that like, I think of this as an organizing problem, you know what I mean? So like people need to become donor organizers. Part of that is doing your giving publicly whenever you can to make, you know, to, to, to decrease the, the um, whatever stigma there may be. Um, I think that's incredibly helpful, but also just thinking about how as a donor you can organize together. So that's where I think, like you're saying, where donor networks come in, um, where people can support each other, can make create opportunities to hear directly from Palestinians, um, can create opportunities together for, for Palestinian led organizations and others that challenge the status quo and are less resourced and less known and less networked. Um, that funder networks, like you said, that come together like human rights funders and women's network, women's um, rights funders and that sort of thing. You know, there's all different kinds of networks where these conversations can can take place. There's way, place, ways to bring people into rooms and act as a validator um, for organizations that are less known, um, inviting them to speak as a, at events as, as experts to get them in, in front of more people, um, doing peer, um, peer education, you know, all kinds of political education um, in order to understand all the things better that we talk about today. And I also want to put under that like delegations, um, the importance of seeing things um, seeing directly um, what's happening. And I think connecting that to commitments afterwards. Um, so not just going to be a, 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 a sort of a, a tourist of, 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 the, of, of what's happening um, to Palestinians on the ground, but doing it as a tool of political education to um, further commitments and accountability. Um, you know, so I think it's really possible to shift norms within philanthropy and public policy. Um, and I think, you know, especially important with Israel has this terrifying new government, um, organizations that folks are supporting are, are going to be under like true existential threat. Um, and so building that collective power and that collective understanding um, is incredibly important. Um, and then the last big category I wanted to mention is just, you know, concrete actions. Um, so that includes giving more money, <laughs> you know, like really pushing yourself to give more, um, giving unrestricted funds, giving for the long term, making longer term commitments so people, so organizations don't have to spend so much time asking year to year and only knowing their budgets year to year, uh, making those long term um, supports, which by the way, right wing organizations do incredibly well, um, you know, so that taking out that uncertainty so organizations can really focus on the work. Um, again, giving to organizing and power building, which is, you know, often the least likely for philanthropic for philanthropy to give to. Um, creating accountability measures internally, like making commitments to what you're going to, to, to what are your measures? Are you going to, can you commit to giving a greater percentage of your support to Palestinian led organizations? What are the, you know, what are the other forms of accountability every organization is going to make their own, but can you create some ways to evaluate yourself or evaluate your collective, whatever your collective may be, um, and hold yourself accountable to those metrics. Um, and just challenging the parameters of the discourse, you know, being bold in every way um, that, we, that we think about that, um, because there really is a lot of power um, in the, in, among donors and among all the various donor organizations. Um, and I would be remiss also if I didn't talk about intermediary organizations and maybe you, you could talk about this better, Sarah, and then I can, but you know, there are tools out there to help newer donors to um, sort of break into the field. And it can be very daunting because how do you know which organizations they give to? And there are legalities that are very difficult to overcome at times. So intermediary organizations um, can, can offer ways for individual donors to pool their collective resources and decision-making, um, be part of political education and ongoing engagement, and to like help with that vetting and due diligence that can, that can be a barrier. To giving, um, and there's also you know really exciting examples of um, donor donor engagement circles where um, people give their money um, and commit to giving for the long term and giving collectively, but then they don't make the decisions specifically about the who they're giving to. They rely on their partners on the ground. So again, it's it's being willing to give up some of the power that you hold as the person giving the resources and putting that power into the hands of the expert. So I think there's like very exciting models that are being developed around how to um, make funding more community directed um, and put it back in the hands of the people who know how to use it and know what they need um, 
And, you know, that can happen again at every level. So there's a lot of, again, to, to sort of go back to the positive note, there are barriers, but there's also very exciting things happening and, and, and tools and resources out there that already exist. Um, and definitely much more um, that we can weave together to help make that collective action possible. But I see it as the moment of real possibility. I love that. I love how, I love your your ability to um, articulate the moment of real possibility here and, and all of those opportunities. And um, you, in the in the end of the report, you have a, an, an appendix or an index of a bunch of organizations and resources where people can go to, to um, get access to some of these donor organizing circles or, um, or, or places just for more information. And I can say, since you brought it up of, of FMEP, um, we, one of the things that has been, I, I joined FMEP three years ago, and one of the things that has been a real delight, especially in the last two years, I think, is that um, we have been working more and more with individual donors, many of whom are Palestinian, um, who who we're working with on who want to increase their own support for Palestinian led organizations or for um, or for the sector overall, but we get to work with them. And it's this like ongoing engagement that is around connection and community building in the sector overall, which is geared towards increasing the amount of resources that are in the hands of our grantees on the ground, whether that's in Israel, Palestine, or in the US. But in doing it, just like you said, it's an organizing opportunity. It's an opportunity to build connection and relationship around resources um, and, and around the movement. And so that's been, I know personally, like extremely exciting and, um, and fulfilling and motivating. And I know that we have partners throughout the movement who are doing this kind of work also. And it is really exciting. There are lots of ways and, and places for people to plug in um, if they're looking for how to, how to plug in and how to learn and how to, how to, basically um, step into the movement that is it has a role for them if they want to step in. And then, as you have been saying this whole time, we're shifting dynamics and um, the funding is one way to shift larger dynamics. And so the, 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 the challenge is much bigger than any individual's giving, but each individual matters in what, what, what um, actions they take. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I consistently learned from you and your activism. So thank you for that ongoing life lesson. Thank, um, you. thank you for making the space to talk about this um, and, and, and bring it to your audience. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. I think that this is a really, really valuable conversation. And, um, and I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to this episode. Um, we'd love to hear back from you about uh, what you think about this conversation and, and um, what other conversations you'd like to hear us to hear us uh, have. And I just want to encourage everyone to visit our website, uh, www.fmep.org, to find any of the many resources that Rebecca and I have talked about in this conversation and to subscribe to FMEP's resources um, overall. And thank you again, Rebecca. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in. And um, I'm Sarah Ann Minkin signing off. Thanks.